Well, hello everyone. I'm so excited to be here at KubeCon Observability Day to see so many attenders from the stage. And today I will be sharing our story of correlating metrics, logs, and chases. I will walk you through our journey from starting with SDKs to eventually bring in eBPF as an enhancement. Um, first off, let me introduce myself. My name is Zhu Jie Kun, and I'm the software engineer and a member of the Otel community. I joined Chuan last year, where, I, where I've been mainly focused on building an observability platform for our business. Today's talk is going to be divided into several parts. First, I will share our experience with observability um, and the infrastructure it based on. Then I will cover how we construct uh, metrics and logs from the trace span, why we need standard signals, and how we achieve that. After that, I will talk about um, why we brought eBPF into the mix, the challenges we've run into while gathering data with it. And I will tie everything together with a final wrap up. First, our journey. Um, I promise that this is only propaganda slides. And our business is primarily focused on interest-based social networking. TDChat is our voice app for gamers. It's quite similar to TeamSpeak on the desktop, but it's specifically designed for voice chat in mobile eSport gaming. Going back to our observability journey, we use Prometheus to collect metrics. And because our business and our applications is widely distributed across different cloud providers and various Kubernetes cluster, so actually our Prometheus is deployed alongside Thanos, which we use to provide global querying um, capability across multiple Prometheus instances and for long-term so storage solutions. For chasing and logging, we've adopted Tencent Cloud as our vendor. Data is collected by the application or the log agent and sent to the vendor. We also have open telemetry collector um, for modifying and filtering spans, providing certain monitoring cap capabilities and maintaining the flexibility to switch between different vendors. And based on these infrastructure components, we also conduct an observability platform that integrate with our configuration management database allowing us to categorize application hierarchically and combine observability data into one centralized platform. So last year, my college told me that while the data integration platform is good, it's not much different from searching for data in various different places. Therefore, we started to think about um, doing more on top of this data foundation. When a user sees a metrics that is on fire, if he has enough experience, he may go to check the corresponding logs. However, if the user is not familiar with it, or if the person who noticed the alarm is an SRE on duty and not the application developer, how can he find out the root cause? If we can provide logs and traces corresponding to the metrics, or in other words, link all of them together, things will become much simpler. So we started looking for potential solutions in the community to correlate different signals. Before we dive into the solution we utilized, which is the spam metrics connector, it's essential to first explore the universal idea of correlating signals. When we think, think about how to correlate different signals, we need to find what they have in common. It becomes appear that Trace has trace IDs, and logs can record those trace IDs. While metrics may not retain every trace ID, they can attach a handful of notable trace IDs while the example up. So in theory, trace ID enable us to correlate all pieces of data. But practically speaking, in our system, it's more common to see logs without trace IDs and metrics without the example up, a consequence of legacy issues. Ideally, we can make changes on a large scale, pushing our developer to include trace IDs in their logs and metrics. However, implementing large scale changes requires significant human power and time. So therefore, we are looking for a solution that can correlate signals um, with most of the work can be done by our observability team. If you are familiar with distributed tracing, 
after trace span is reported, it's received, processed, and exported to the vendor by the OTEL collector. A trace span um, contains a lot of information, including the application's name, span type, for example, is an RBC request or a database query, duration, and resp response status. Using this information, it's entirely possible to construct metrics like query per second and latency error rate, also known as the RED metrics. The Open Telemetry Collector offers a component called Span Metrics Connector that makes this possible. It converts span into metrics like this and carries the attributes of the span as labels. We modify accordingly to explore metrics like this um, whose metrics name and labels name um, follows our standard. Based on the similar idea, since span can also carry information such as um, query statement and HTTP arguments, we also develop a span log connector which exports log to the vendor. More importantly, um, th the data transformed from span will carry a trace ID or an example, and we have full control over it. This means we don't, we don't need to push users to make any changes in order to get correlated signals. And you may be curious about how much extra resource it need to add this logic outside the original trace pipeline. We conduct benchmark tests on span metrics connector with workload ranging from 2,500 to 20,000 span per second. The purple column and lines represent the trace pipeline, while the red columns and lines represent the trace and metrics pipeline, which include both the span metrics connector and the Prometheus exporter. As you can see, there is almost no difference in CPU usage between the two, with the additional um, pipeline causing only a slight increase in CPU utilization. When examining the memory data, the trace and metrics pipeline on average use 38% more memory. This increase is tied to the number of different combinations of label values in metrics, also known as the cardinality of the label, label value. And these are the benchmark result. And in actual usage, um, I'm sorry that I cannot share our data from the production environment due to some auditing reasons. Instead, I took the data from one of la our largest test cluster, which reports um, 14,000 spans per second. After transforming them into metrics and logs, the CPU usage of the ODAP collector increased by 4%, and memory usage went up by 24%. I believe that cost-wise, this is a relatively inexpensive solution for obtaining correlatable signals without having to modify any user code. However, as more and more teams express interest in using this solution, we face a challenge due to the diversity of span they reported. Um, for instance, spans describing MySQL requests might have different span name and attribute, attribute formats. To generate consistent metrics, we need to standardize those span using various span or trace processor before the transformation, which lead to a growing number of configuration to be managed. This is quite impractical, and the more pipeline we have, the more resource they consume, and also the human resource is needed. Our ultimate goal is to make sure that the metrics and logs we get from chases are all in standard formats. We realize that um, maintaining different configuration is necessary due to the diversity of span. If there is a way to standardize all the span, or at least those important ones we care about, such as those um, for HTTP or Redis call, that would be quite beneficial. And the configuration of the open telemetry collector could also be simplified. So our task boils down to unifying and standardizing the important spans. The first thing we did was to design um, standardized attributes for spans, spe specifying the enumeration of keys and values. And this is our attributes protocol. Well, actually, this is not a good practice because OTEL has already defined a common set of semantic attributes. I would recommend using them if there is no concern regarding legacy issues. But anyway, now we have a standard within the organization. Establishing the protocol was straightforward, but pushing everyone to adopt the changes has been challenging. To simplify the changes, we also create, create middlewares and interceptors for various frameworks and client SDKs. 
This extension method are applied by the frameworks themselves, and most frameworks and client SDKs can be integrated with just one or two lines of, of code changes. After integration, the span they reported will follow to the protocol we have established. Actually, it doesn't matter whether you use a customized SDK middleware or an open source project, as long as they can report according to a specific protocol across the whole organization. And so far, everything seems to be going pretty well, except that we suddenly found our Prometheus instance keeps going down. If you think about it, we are generating so-called standard metrics for um, those HTTP and MySQL calls and others, which obviously includes labels with high cardinality. If anyone runs a query without the, co um, the correct label filter, such as service name, cluster, or namespace, Prometheus may crash. To safely use those standard metrics, we've, uh, we've added a PromQL proxy in front of our Thanos. We pass every request separating the metrics and labels in the PromQL. For specific metrics, if the necessary labels are missing or the query time range is too broad, we will reject the request. We also set um, TTL for those standard metrics, so if a time series hasn't been updated for a while, it will be dropped from the scrapping result. These are fairly common measures um, to protect the Prometheus. In addition to this, we also try out an experimental feature of Prometheus, which is the native histogram. Uh, native histogram has been introduced many times at past KubeCon, so I won't go over the implementation again. After enabling native histogram, we can observe a change in the precision of the collected data. The resolution of the data on the right is visually higher. And this is also from our test cluster, and it may not look impressive due to the lack of sufficient samples. I'd like to reuse a graph from previous speaker to show that native histogram provides a significantly higher precision, and it comes with the bonus of better performance and resource usage. So check this out. With native histogram on, we are seeing a 30% faster scrap time for those high cardinality targets. And for queries, native histogram um, with different bucket factor are speeding things up by 60% to 80% compared to the conventional histogram when dealing with 13,000 time series. The bucket factor impacts the resolution of native histogram. The lower the bucket factor, the finer the detail. And with a bucket factor of 1.1, you get really precise data, and it still runs better than the conventional histogram. And so by now, we've managed to provide those um, standard signals along with the capability to process and display them. But in the observability domain, there's always a challenge you've got to face. No matter how easy we make the instrumentation, there are always users who don't want to make any changes. So we need to add the last piece to our observability platform, which is the ability to collect data without any code changes. Thankfully, the involving eBPF technique offers us many options. We went with DeepFlow, which is also a CNCF project. In our use case, eBPF can essentially be seen as a network package collector. We deploy the eBPF agent on our Kubernetes cluster to collect um, the network package sent and received by the application, which are then reported to the eBPF server. The eBPF server converts them into logs, traces, and metrics according to the standard signal protocol for storage. Um, this workflow looks pretty simple, but we've, got, we've still faced some problems when it comes to using the data in the real world. The biggest problem is how to link up the eBPF spans. In our practice, the eBPF agent doesn't modify any network calls, so um, there is actually no application instrumentation involved, meaning that the collected spans won't have trace ID or span IDs. Instead, they come with information like TCP sequence or syscall trace IDs. To display it like a normal trace, we typically need to start with a particular span, then searching for related span using attributes like TCP sequence, syscall trace ID, and thread IDs. We keep doing this recursively, checking down the additional related spans until there are no span, no new span could be found. 
And in the end, we sort all the span by time and TCP sequence relationship, among other criteria. The whole process is like the animation here. Overall, I think this idea is workable and serve as an implement, implementation method when there is no trace IDs available. In our real world use, this method requires significantly more times for each query compared to the traditional SDK instrument when dealing with, um, especially when dealing with a high amount of spans. And for data collected by the ABPF agent, we need to store it in the clickhouse first, which takes up a um, substantial amount of space. To reduce the disk usage, we need to perform data sampling. Typically, we locate span with error or long duration in ClickHouse, and by using the earlier mentioned um, recursive search, we find the trace they belong to, along with the associated spans. All those spans are then um, stored into another ClickHouse instance, creating the final sample data set for user to query. If you are familiar with tail-based sampling in distributed tracing, the concept here is quite similar. The only difference is that um, the eBPF method uses disk instead of memory, which incur higher causes and offer less performance. This operation sounds quite heavy, right? Um, we think so. We believe that eBPF programs that do not modify any data are generally considered safer. That's our initial impression and the reason why we chose Diffro instead of other eBPF projects that do instrument the application. And in our case, we hope to collect observability data as much as possible with least amount of resources. After running this um, on production for a while, we believe it is necessary to reconsider whether it is worth using so many re storage and computing resources. Or in other words, whether it is worth using ABPF for distributed tracing. And Finally, after doing some evaluation, we remove the storage of trace data collected by the ABPF. Once they are transformed into metrics and logs in memory, they are immediately discarded. This saves us um, the space of storage and about 30% of CPU, use, uh, CPU resources as well as 70% of memory, which is a significant cost reduction for us. And now let's wrap things up. Our approach for correlating signals is based on the spam matrix connector. We've modified the OTL collector to enable it to transform span into both logs and metrics. And in order to handle spans reported by different applications, we define a protocol for span attributes and build numerous middleware and interceptors for frameworks and client SDKs. This allows applications to report standardized spans. And for spans that cannot integrate with those middlewares, we also deployed ABPF agent to collect data on their cluster, serving as a supplementary method to user-side integration. And currently, our ABPF pipeline handles over 600,000 spans per second in a single cluster. Although we have abandoned the ability to display traces, it still offers very meaningful support for metrics and logs. Um, we believe that to fully explore the potential of eBPF, it's best to use eBPF program that actually modify and instrument the application, such as Gravana Bela. I remember that their latest release already supports many frameworks and clients that we need, and we hope to try out in the future. But of course, we also have to consider the actual performance overhead. So that's the story of our observability platform, and as I said, We've made so many mistakes, and for, for example, not using OTEL's semantic attributes as a standard, and our work on eBPF is far from perfect. However, there were limitations at the time, and I hope you can look at what we went through and say, hey, let's avoid that when planning similar things. I hope the idea of the spam metrics connector can also inspire you to build things beyond metrics and logs because the trace span really carries a lot of information. And that's it. If you are interested in our experience and would like to continue the conversation, you can find me on GitHub or Twitter. And as English is not my first language, in case I may misunderstand your question, I would recommend you to scan a QR code or visit the link below, which will redirect you to a Google form to write down your questions. And thanks again for joining my session. Much appreciated.